All right, so uh, we are delighted uh, today to have uh, George Noronha here to speak with us. Uh, George received his PhD in 2007 from the Goethe University of Frankfurt, uh, where we met for the first time, which is really lovely. Uh, for his PhD work, he was awarded the Gurno and Frank Karin Prize. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but that's very impressive. That was in 2008. From 2008 to 2011, George was a postdoc at Columbia University. And then from 2011 to 2019, was faculty member at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, um, where he was became an affiliate member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences in 2015. Since August 2019, George has been in the physics department of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, UIEC, a very, very good school for physics, especially for theoretical physics, and especially for theoretical physics of many particles, which is really what we're going to be talking about here today. And since 2020, has been the Associate Director of the Illinois Center for Advanced Studies of the Universe, uh, and is an expert in a large number of fields, in particular relativistic fluid dynamics, which we're going to hear about today. So when you're ready, uh, George, thank you very much for agreeing to talk with us, and please take it away. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for this introduction, and thanks uh, a lot, Will. It's, it's always very nice to see you again. We go way back. <laughs> way, Who's 20 years now, huh? Oh yes, isn't that weird? Yeah, that's that's wow. strange. I don't know. Let me see if you if you already have dark hair. I don't. Uh, sorry, dark hair, uh, gray hair. Do you? I don't think. You <laughs> I, I shaved this morning, so you can't see. Oh uh, yeah, it's, it's just the beard. The beard is that water parameter that tells our age, but the the hair actually still works most of the time. So okay, great. So I'm very excited to talk to you about this. Um, as I said, this the 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 point of the first. Um, seminar here is to go very slowly, but sort of like just explain the big ideas in a sort of um, using a typical notation with typical concepts that you have seen, like conservation of energy, mass, and whatever. And so, but the point is to set up the stage for the, the real new thing, which will be um, next week, okay? So next week, we're gonna talk about neutron star mergers, heavy ion collisions, the very applicability, or discuss the very applicability of our concepts or what constitutes a fluid, are not in under very, very extreme conditions. But first, so the goal of this uh, seminar, as I said, is just to explain using a very simple example, the challenges that emerge when you try to put it together, uh, dissipation and relativity, okay? So in, in you know, just I'm considering the case of uh, relativistic mini body systems. Uh, it turns out that it's a very hard problem and people have been studying this for many years. What we'll see eventually is that uh, effective field theory, so ideas from effective field theory, actually very, very useful uh, to solve the issues that appear with causality and stability in these systems that really plagued the field for decades. So let's start uh, right away. Let's start very simple, recalling just uh, some ideas and properties of normal relativistic fluids, okay? So before I talk about relativistic fluids, let's talk about first, non-relativistic fluids. This is the thing that most people should be um, aware. And at least if you didn't have a class on it, you certainly have lived on Earth on average, you know, 20 years or so. So you have certainly experienced non-fluid, non-relativistic fluid dynamics. So consider a, a non-relativistic system, okay? Something where the velocity is not really close to the speed of light. Uh, I also imagine that quantum mechanic effects are not very important. So for most part of this talk, H bar is not one, is irrelevant, okay? It, 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 H bar appears in a very, very subtle things uh, when you try to compute the equation of state or some other properties that have to do with the microscopic uh, uh, aspects of the matter. But for the most part, just imagine a standard classical system, actually even more is assume that the fundamental laws of the universe are like Newton's laws, okay? So imagine that you have the system, like for example, the gas uh, here, like or the, the, the air that is here around you. And of course, this air is made of a lot of molecules. And what happens, I mean, the dynamics is very simple. You have a bunch of molecules and you know, you know, every once in a while, some molecule collides with another. Um, and that's basically the microscopic theory that is happening here in the air around us. So, but one thing that is important is that these molecules are not really created or destroyed. So at this energy scale, there is the phenomenon of mass conservation. So mass is conserved. This means that if there is some volume here, if the amount of mass changed here, so if I have some volume and I have some mass, if the amount of mass changed there, 
is because either some mass got in or some mass got out. If it gets in or out, it has to go across the surface. So the interesting thing to compute to see how much the amount of mass is changing that given volume V is to see how much mass is going across. So there's a current of mass either going across the surface getting out or coming in. That's the idea of mass conservation, okay? So the number of molecules, uh, the total number of molecules was, doesn't really change. So in a way to describe this, what we do is the following. So we have some density. So this is the number of, of molecules in a given volume. And as you see, this is a field, this is a scalar field. It's a scalar under rotations, something that depends on time and space. This is the density of the molecules. And uh, the other object that we're gonna talk about will be the current. So this is the current, is basically the flux here, is the flux of mass that goes across the surface, okay? This uh, volume V has some surface. The surface, I'm gonna write it as dV. So it's just the area. So this V is a, you know, is a volume, it has a, some closed surface. And this whole story that I did with my hands here about mass conservation can be written in the following way. First, in an integral form, you can write that the variation in time of the amount of stuff inside of that volume um, is equal to minus the amount of stuff that crosses the surface. That's what this equation tells you, okay? So, um, so as you said, uh, so in undergrad, you already have seen things like this before. When you talked, especially about ENM, if you didn't have a, a fluid dynamics cl class, in ENM for sure, you have seen densities and fluxes across the surface and things like that. So this is the statement of mass conservation um, in an integral form. But now, um, Using the divergence theorem, right? The fact that you can rewrite this integral in terms of a volume integral about with the divergence of J, okay? You can just write this assuming, of course, remember I when I drew this thing here, I didn't really have to tell you that this volume looked like a sphere or it looked like, I don't know, a brick. It is basically any volume. That's the beauty of it. If this thing has to work for any given volume V, you can actually write down a local version. So a differential version of this integral law here. And the differential version is the following. It's like this DT goes inside and you end up with an equation that is very famous. And in most uh, contexts, this is just called the continued equation or the uh, differential law or the, 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 the law of conservation of mass. So this is the local version of conservation of mass. And um, I'm assuming that you're all familiar with these you know, mathematical symbols. Of course, this is a spatial, a partial derivative with respect to time. And this guy is a divergent or the gradient, sorry. This is an operator. It's a vector of derivatives, right? So if there is something that is not clear, please let me know, okay? Because I'm assuming a few things here because it's, it's kind of hard for me to know, um, you know, everybody that is there. But this type of equation has some of the- You go through questions as you go along, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this equation I have seen before. Uh, for example, you see that in ENM, this is a fundamental equation that once Maxwell realized that the electric charge had to be conserved or the number of particles of, charged particles could not be destroyed or created, actually contributed to create the less term that appears in Maxwell's equation that is fundamental for you to actually uh, understand that light is just you know, a wave, an electromagnetic wave. But in this case, what you have, the variation of the density locally um, has to do with the divergence of this current. And in this case, this current is very, very simple. It's just something some density, so basically imagine a bunch of little particles crossing some surface, right? So um, instead of just talking about the parts, we can talk about the density of momentum going through uh, this surface. So that's what this J is. So we write J as rho V. And rho V is basically momentum, MV, divided by the volume, okay? So that's how you should see. So density of momentum, momentum density. Great, so this just tells us the mass is conserving. That's how you describe it. But now there are more things that are conserved that as we learn in classical mechanics. The other thing 
that um, you learn in classical mechanics is, you know, Newton's laws, in particular, Newton's second law, right? So normally you write it like this, dp dt equals the sum of all forces. So the variation of the momentum is equal to the sum of all forces. And then what you do in fluid mechanics, you consider not just one particle, but you consider some a little fluid volume, which is something like this. So imagine that this is some little fluid volume and in, in each fluid volume, you have a lot of particles, okay? And basically the fluid is a bunch of these little fluid volumes interacting. And how do they interact? It's not like they have some external forces or at least in this case, some electric field or magnetic field, no. What they do is that one presses against the other. So one is pressing against the other. So you see the interaction happens across the surface. So there is one little cube here and there could be another one here. I don't know how to draw these things, but I guess you get the point. It's one guy pressing on the other, okay? So the forces have to do how much force you put across some surface. That's the idea of pressure, okay? So basically what you do, and you can see this in standard treatments of, of fluid dynamics, you use, you apply this Newton's second law for these little fluid elements, okay? Once you do that, you realize just like here that the variation of the momentum has to do with the forces, but the forces are really per unit area. So this will have to do with pressure. So in the end, what you find is a local statement about what happens to the momentum density of the field or of, of the fluid. So the equation that comes out, and I'm gonna write it here, is this, and this equation um, looks more complicated than the other. Um, okay, so let me introduce the notation a little bit. So this equation, this is the equation that describes local conservation of momentum. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit more what the symbols are here. So the, there are several things that are different about the, this equation here and the other one, the continuity equation. The first thing for the continuity equation, you see this is a, a single equation. This other one is not. This one is actually three equations together. That's what this symbol I here means. Uh, I'm using the notation that I can write a vector V as in Vx, Vy, Vz. Okay, so it's a three-dimensional Think and this V is the velocity field, just like before. This is the velocity field. This tells an idea of how the particles are moving as a function of time and space. So there's this little fluid element moving across the system. And when I write I here, I could be X, Y, and Z, and that's why there are three equations. And this, as you see, this is the variation of the momentum density is equal to the sum of the forces. And here, Okay, this, this symbol, let me see. This symbol looks complicated, but it's basically saying that the variation of the momentum is, the, is minus the gradient of something like a potential, okay? That's what this pi ij is. This pi ij mathematically uh, is more complicated than a vector, okay? This guy here is a tensor. And really what it is, is a three by three matrix, okay? And what it's called is called the stress tensor. And basically what it's telling you, it's, it completely describes to you all the forces that act on each one of the surfaces of the little um, fluid element, okay? This uh, is a three by three matrix and that's what this symbol is. So and there is this I and J and both I and J can go from X, Y, and Z, okay? That's why you have three by three. So this is a matrix. And the interesting thing that you see here, um, so remember, um, in the end, um, linear algebra still has to work. And if this is a vector, this quantity here must be a vector, and it is. This symbol here, di, dij, so let me just write this. So the first thing is I'm writing uh, using something called Einstein's notation. Yeah, we're good on Einstein's summation. Huh? We're good on Einstein's summation for sure. Excellent. In, so we are good. So yeah, just to clarify, this guy here then really means something like this. Um, dx pi x i plus dy pi y i plus dz pi z i. Great. Okay. So um, this is an important equation. This basically tells what's happening to the momentum of the system. And uh, in the simplest case, the case where no entropy is produced, Pi ij. Before you 
before you go on, so yes. physically, so is I the direction of the force on the like J direction of the surface? Is that how I should think about this pi IJ? Um, honest, I mean, this is sort of like that. I mean, it's it's symmetric, so it doesn't really matter because uh, pi IJ is you know is a symmetric tensor, but. Yeah, the way you should think about it, it's that one gives you the force, the other one gives the where, which you know, um, which surface this thing is acting. It's basically the the way I see it. So, for example, let me just write the 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 standard case in the ideal case. So, ideal here means something that does not produce entropy, as I'll, I'll show soon. Um, this guy, so the simplest thing that it can be is that you could have a variation of the momentum because there is a gradient of pressure, right? So like this, so you have the pressure in a given direction and you wanna see how that pressure in the given direction changes across the other dimensions, right? So we have some pressure in direction X, right? Something going in the direction X and you wanna see that field in the direction X, how that varies in X, Y, and Z. So pi ij, looks, uh, you can write it like this, P delta IJ, and this is the Kronecker delta, plus rho VI VJ. So rho is the density, VI and VJ are just the, the velocities. And um, so this one takes a little longer to explain, but this one should be basically what I said. Um, so you see that the first term, let me just write it like this, DT, DT of rho V, plus, so the first one will be delta I B. So how much the pressure varies in that direction tells you what is the acceleration, right? So imagine the case where the density is constant, you can pull it out from the derivative, the time derivative, and it basically is telling you that if there is an acceleration, so a source for acceleration in a given direction is how much the pressure is varying that direction. That's the first term here. The other one is more complicated. The other one is more complicated because, um, um, you have to write it kind of like this and has to do with the velocities and the fact that um, this uh, little this little uh, uh, fluid element deforms as it moves. Um, but I think I think it's, it's enough at this point to just realize first, there is a fundamental equation that describes mass conservation. And there's a second equation that tells you how much the momentum changes or what happens to acceleration uh, when the fluid is in the presence of internal forces, okay? So these are things that are modifying the surface. They act on the surfaces of the little fluid elements. That's what this thing means. Later, what are we gonna do? We're gonna actually add new terms that will appear in this pi ij in this stress tensor coming from viscous effects. So things that create um, entropy. So if you have these equations, so the equations so far are these. So this is all for non-relativistic systems, okay? We're gonna to get to the other problem soon. Um, then, um, you know, this is already in a sense okay, because you could say, oh, I have how many equations? I have four equations, because this guy here has three, and this guy here has one. And really I have how many variables? Well, I have V, so V has three variables. I have rho, one variable, one field. But then you say, oh, wait, I also have P. So how can I solve something with four equations and five variables? Well, uh, you don't, but there's not a problem here because actually P or rho, you, you don't need to see them as an independent variable. So for example, because P is given as a function of rho, this is what the equation of state is. And that's where thermodynamics comes in. Thermodynamics and the fact that you're describing, for example, you know, molecules of air instead of neutrons in a neutron reactor, the difference at this level would come precisely in the properties of the microscopic uh, of, of, of the equation of state. So the equation of state, the microscopic physics dictates how the pressure varies with the density. And in this case, you actually have really four variables because um, you have three for the velocity and one for rho, and you have four equations in principle you can solve. Of course, there are many things going on here in these equations. These are no linear uh, uh, coupled PDEs. Um, you can ask me questions about this later, but these equations in principle are things that you can solve. 
But there is something else that is very important in thermodynamics that is missing. So far, I haven't talked about temperature. Okay. So what happens to temperature? How do you include temperature here? Well, it'll be interesting to understand, of course, the, the general case where the pressure is not just a function of the density, but also a function of the temperature. Okay. So, um, so far we had four variables for four equations, but um, if we want to add the physics of temperature or see how the temperature now evolves as a field in hydrodynamics, something that depends on time and space, um, we would have, if that's the case, we would now have five variables, Vi, Rho, and T as my fundamental variables. So there are five here, five variables. And of course I need five equations. So far, I only have four, but there is another equation, okay? And especially that's the case that I'm gonna talk about now. If you consider an ideal fluid, okay? So an ideal fluid for me here is a fluid that does not produce entropy or is, is a fluid where the entropy is conserved. So what I mean, just like I talked about the mass being conserved, the total entropy in a volume, um, if it changes in some given volume, if it changes is because some particles come in or some particles got out and the particles carry the entropy. So there's gonna be an entropy current, just like there was a mass current, there's gonna be an entropy current. And basically what this concept gives you is a new equation, is an equation for conservation of the entropy. And the local version of this equation going through the same steps that we did before for mass conservation, we would write something like this, d dt of s plus the divergence of s v, okay? And s here is not the total entropy, this is the entropy density, is the amount of entropy in a given volume or per unit volume, okay? And this guy here is the entropy current. And this is great because from thermodynamics, uh, so now I have this equation here. So I have three, I have five equations. I have this one. I have the, this here, just to remind you. And I have this one here. Plus dj by ji equals zero. So I have entropy conservation. Entropy, this describes entropy conservation. This is mass conservation. And this one, of course, is momentum conservation. And this is useful now because in thermodynamics, if I know, for example, if I know the temperature and the density, I should be able to recover what the entropy density is, or, you know, basically, if you know two thermodynamic variables, you can always find the other, right? You can always find the third. That's what the whole thermodynamic uh, um, inequal or, uh, equalities or relations give you. And how the entropy varies with the density and with the temperature, this is given by the equation of state. So and the equation of state, of course, that I, that I mentioned here is a property in equilibrium, okay? the property in equilibrium. So you do equilibrium thermodynamics um, and you compute these properties. For example, for the ideal gas, so the ideal gas here, um, it'll be something like this Kb, which is the Boltzmann constant, the density times the temperature. This will be the equation of state. Now, um, there is something that you may be wondering, it's like, okay, but why do you talk about entropy conservation? Because naturally, from my you know, old uh, classical mechanics days, what I would think about, of course, yeah, nice mass conservation is there. That's great. Uh, momentum conservation is there. So basically, if the momentum density is changing because there is some force, in this case, some internal force acting on the little fluid element. Um, but we normally don't talk about entropy in classical mechanics. We talk about energy conservation or the fact that ent energy may not be conserved because there is some friction or something like this. Something creates heat, right? So in fact, um, the final form of these equations, um, I mean, you can use it like this, like I wrote, but there is also another way, which is the one that I'm gonna mention now, which is very useful for us, is basically the following. If you use the momentum conservation equation, 
uh, the continuity equation and basic thermodynamic um, identities, right? So for example, the statement of the first law of thermodynamics in the differential form, which is this here, let me introduce the little symbols here. Epsilon, this is the internal energy density. So this is the energy density that is not just uh, coming from kinetic energy. This is the one related to temperature. Uh, this is, you know, when you compute averages in thermodynamics coming from the partition function, you compute this guy, this internal energy density. T is the temperature, S is the entropy density. Mu, mu is the chemical potential. And the chemical potential, as you can see here, is basically telling you how much energy you gain or you lose or how much the energy changes if you vary the number of particles. That's what the chemical potential is telling you, okay? It's just a way for you to understand what happens to your system. If you change the number of particles, how much the energy of the system changes. And N, oh, so it's not N, it's rho. Okay. Rho is the density, okay? So this is the first law. This is the statement of the first law of thermodynamics. And basically it's telling you, um, this is already for reversible processes, but normally what you learn for the first law of thermodynamics is basically understanding what happens to conservation of energy once you are allowed to have heat or you know something goes into heat, right? So the, the amount of energy or work you do in something, there's some sort of object or some system, um, you can make the system move, but you can also have some energy going to heat and that kind of energy you don't recover, right? It spreads out throughout the system. And the statement of first law of thermodynamics is to say that, um, the total energy of the system, if we include not only the standard mechanical energy, but also the energy in heat or in some other sources, this whole thing is conserved. And that's why we need to talk about entropy, to talk about energy conservation in this broad sense in fluid dynamics. If we use then, as I said, these two equations here and standard thermodynamic identities, you end up with the final equation that we want which is the equation that I will tell you about energy conservation, which is this one that I'm writing. So there is one little new symbol here, which you'll see. Okay, so here is the following. So this is the equation for the local statement of energy conservation. And it's, it's pretty interesting. Because you see, um, the amount of energy is not just the kinetic energy, like here. There is also the internal energy, the one related to temperature and, and entropy. That's this guy here. So if this quantity varies, it's because there was some flux of energy going in or out of the volume. That's what this current here is, is an energy current. And the energy current depends on the density of kinetic energy, as you see here, rho, rho v squared divided by two. There is some little velocity here because the particles are the things that carry the energy in and out. You see, all the currents so far had velocity. This guy had a velocity. This guy here had a velocity. This guy had a velocity. So it makes sense. The particles are the things that carry the quantities of the fluid in and out of a volume. This W, um, and it's really bad because later I'm going to use omega, but this W is called enthalpy. It's just a thermodynamical quantity. It's just epsilon plus p. So it's uh, importance is not that, uh, I mean, it's not that relevant here. The only point that you need to know is that um, we now have all the equations I wanted just to talk about the standard non-relativistic um, ideal fluid. And I'm just going to write them here again because I'm going to make a point. And this will be a good time to ask about uh, you know, if you want to know some standard properties of these equations and uh, other facts about them. So let me just write them here. Rho V was zero and DT rho VI was DJ pi JI plus zero. So energy conservation, uh, mass conservation, and momentum. Great. Very good. So these are the conserved quantities in your system. You see, the idea here is pretty neat because 
a many body system is very complicated, right? So if you get any system that has many, 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 many degrees of freedom, and here we're talking about like 10 to the 23 degrees of freedom inside of your system. Um, if you were to describe every single one of them, what they're doing as a function of time, you could in principle do it for this little classical system, but it will be pretty useless because it will not tell you what the system is actually doing. If you just look at every single little particle, how it's collided with another particle, you know, once in a, in a blue moon, you would not know that there is some wind when I do like this with my hand. Okay, it'll be very hard to go from this UV description to this infrared description, right? Um, and it's, it's uh, the important part to, to realize here that in order to understand the motion or what happens to this many body system at very long wavelengths and very long time. So basically, if you're not really bothering to see what each little molecule is doing, it'll be very important for you to look at conserved quantities. These conserved quantities are the ones that will dictate the large uh, scale structure of the motion of these fluids, okay, or of these systems. And the conserved things are the ones you would expect, energy, momentum, and in this case, mass, okay? Good, you have five equations and five variables. And the five variables are, uh, you can write, for example, the five variables as rho, V, and for example, E, or temperature, let me write this temperature. Okay, so you have five variables and five equations. And then in principle, you can solve them. This system of equations um, is very important. It describes how a fluid can do its thing and propagate and spread out in space and time without creating entropy. So entropy is conserved in this system of equations. Okay, great. But that's not what we want. We want to consider a real system and real fluids like the air around us does produce entropy, okay? There are situations where entropy production is relevant. How do you modify these equations taking into account entropy production? Well, first, uh, for sure, if entropy is produced, this little equation here, the one that I said the entropy was conserved is not true anymore. However, the equation for conservation of energy, is still true, okay? The equation for mass conservation is still true. And the equation or the idea that momentum is conserved, it's still true. There is just one little difference, okay? And it's precisely will come here. And here, um, when you see the balance between energy varying in a, in a little volume and the amount of current that goes in and out, the difference is that the current cannot be just this. Because if the current is this, okay? Or if the pi ij is the one that I said before, the system does not produce entropy. So the modification will come at what these currents are. So there will be new terms, new terms that once you put them in, you will see that entropy is actually not conserved, okay? So what can change? So I said that the change will come with these two equations and you may ask, why don't you change the mass conservation equation? Well, because you know, if you think about it, the mass conservation, I mean, it really doesn't matter if the thing is it's conserved or not, if the entropy is conserved or not. In fact, remember, you did mass conservation or better, the continuity equation, the context E and M, and you never worried about entropy or anything like that, right? So it's, it's, it's actually more general. It's just counting the number of particles that go in and out, right? If you afterwards attribute some dissipation or not, that's your problem. This equation is very general and will not be modified. There's nothing you need to do in this case. However, um, if you think about the other ones, they are very general, but the terms, these currents, um, I made a choice. I said that I don't want entropy to be produced, and that's precisely reflected in the form of these currents. So in general, what you can write, right? So now I'm going to write something like this. I could write my dt rho vi plus dj pi ij. But this guy here, when I say this is equal to zero, so momentum is still conserved, my, my, but my pi ij is whatever it was before. If I were to stop here, there is no entropy being produced, but then there must be something else, some new tensor that I put in that once this guy is in, then entropy can be produced. Okay, so I have to go beyond 
the ideal case. So this is the ideal fluid. And this one here leads to dissipation or produces entropy. We just have to guess or derive what this tensor is. The same thing for the, for the energy. For the energy, I can write this in a more general way, which I'm gonna write it here, like that, plus some of the divergence of some uh, energy density current. And this energy density current, it will be uh, just like it was before here, the enthalpy plus kinetic energy density divided by two times V plus something new, because once I include this something new, I can produce entropy. Okay, and this part here is the ideal case. So what you see is that the form, the general form of the conservation laws are the same, just the details that change. The, for the momentum conservation, the energy conservation, then just, I'm gonna uh, also include here, um, I'm gonna include here the, oh, I already mentioned the, the mass conservation, that's fine. Okay, good. So. Um, I hope it's clear that in order to produce entropy, you need more stuff. You need more stuff. Okay, the question now is, okay, that's great, but how do you determine this new thing? How do you, how do you, you know, construct or derive or define what these things are? Well, there are two ways, okay, to do this. There is what I would call the top-down approach. And the bottom up approach. So the top down approach is the following. Okay, so let's talk about this first. So, top down. What I mean by top down is the following. Um, you know, this system, whatever you're going to describe, some fluid or something, it's made of something like molecules, right? And of course, as you vary the description of your system, if you're able to access shorter and shorter wavelength, you're gonna see that the system behaves differently, right? So it goes from a little fluid like this, which is con a continuous system for us to little you know, particles colliding um, every once in a while. So the top-down approach consists, consists in specifying the microscopic theory, right? So whatever the microscopic theory is, so for example, this could be, you know, the Boltzmann equation, right? That tells you how the interactions influence the motion or determine the, the properties of this fluid. Um, or it could be quantum field theory, right? Which is, you know, the ultimate description of reality so far. The Boltzmann equation is an effective uh, description of some quantum field theoretical system. So you could start from quantum field theory, do something that we call a coarse graining procedure. So that means taking averages, suitably defined averages um, of different observables. And after this coarse graining procedure, you do a, some systematic truncation. That's the, and the word systematic is important here because this is hard to do. You do some truncation because you see the QFT describes everything. But you don't want it to describe everything. You just want to see what happens to these conserved quantities. So somehow you have to make sure that you don't really need to talk about the very fast moving things, but you know that you cannot just throw away the very fast moving things. They are always there. They enter in the equation of state and the calculation of transport coefficient that you see later and so forth. So basically that's the idea. You start from the microscopic theory and you invent a suitable way to systematically truncate the number of degrees of freedom such that you end up with equations for these quantities like densities um, and you know pressure and things like that. And of course, if you wanna go even further, at some point you hit the string theory, right? But for sure, we don't need to go all the way there. Um, so this is the top-down approach. You start in the UV and you keep doing averages on coarse grain until you end up in the infrared. Um, this is a well-defined procedure. It is extremely hard to do in practice, okay? But there are methods that you can do given some microscopic theory, how you end up 
the idea is that you derive hydrodynamics out of some microscopic theory. This is not what I'm going to talk about here. I'm going to talk about what I'm going to call bottom up. And the bottom up approach has been successful for more than a century. Um, and this will end up with the equations called the Navier Stokes equations. So, in practice, what you do is the following. Okay. You just guess what the answer is. Right. And of course, you know, uh, in general, it's not very easy to guess what the answer is of anything. But in this case, um, if you define the rules very precisely, and that's where effective field theory comes about, uh, you can actually guess what the fluid can be under certain conditions. You're not going to be able to describe what can happen to the system, some crazy, far from equilibrium conditions at first, but you would be able to describe at least, for example, as we see here, what happens to the system near equilibrium. How does the system start to dissipate or start to create entropy if you're very, very close to equilibrium? That is a question that we can actually write down what those tensors, sigma ij and qi, should be. So it, let's, let's construct exactly how, what the idea is. Imagine that the system is in equilibrium. So what I mean, I mean global thermal equilibrium, OK? And this will be, for example, the state where temperature, the velocity of the system, and the density are all constant, OK? Let's think about the simplest equilibrium state. For example, um, if you have some water in a cup and just leave it there, you would say that the velocity is 0. Uh, if you wait you know, long, long enough that the thing is not moving or doing anything, the average density is constant and the temperature is constant and uniform, OK? And of course, if that's the case, there's no entropy production, right? The system is in thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium is the state of the maximum entropy. So there's nothing for the entropy to grow because it's in equilibrium. So that's fine. So the point is the following. Whatever these tensors, sigma ij and qi, so this is the correction to the stress tensor. So like the viscous stress, uh, that's the part of the forces over area that create entropy. And this guy here is the dissipative energy current. Is the part of the current of energy that goes with the system that will eventually create entropy. So the point is that if you're very close to equilibrium, we can actually describe what these are because, you know, just think about this. If you are in equilibrium, what should these things be? In equilibrium, you don't dissipate. Entropy is a maximum. These things should be zero in equilibrium. So you already know something about them. They're not so crazy, okay? So you already know that they have to be zero in equilibrium. And what you would expect is that if you are very close to equilibrium, these things here are small. So they're small, close to equilibrium. Okay, great. But what do you mean by, by small, right? What do I mean by small? Well, I mean, let's think about it, right? So what are the, the things that are zero in equilibrium uh, invoking these quantities? Of course, the temperature is not zero. I'm not considering a zero temperature system. The density is not zero. And the velocity may be zero or maybe just some constant uh, vector field. But if you are in equilibrium, um, you, I think you would agree with me that this quantity here is zero, right? If you are in equilibrium, the time variation of the temperature, right? The, 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 the time derivative of the temperature should be zero. Um, also, if you are in equilibrium, you would assume that this guy is zero. The variation of the density is zero. And also, you would assume that this guy here is zero, OK? So you can start constructing all the possible quantities involving the standard hydrodynamic variables. They are zero in equilibrium, right? So the, the idea is that if the temperature is constant, equilibrium. If the temperature is not constant, it's not in equilibrium. So that's what I mean by small. I'm going to look for possible ways that I can write down these tensors involving quantities that are small near equilibrium. And of course, they are zero exactly in equilibrium. OK? And this seems to be kind of vague, but it actually becomes very precise. It becomes very precise because basically what you have to do is the following. You say that this guy is zero in equilibrium and has corrections when you are near equilibrium. OK? 
And these corrections involve things that are small. And what are the quantities that we can do? They are small near equilibrium. Well, they are derivatives, suitably defined derivatives of the variables, the hydrodynamic variables. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm putting some, this means order of derivatives, something that involves the first derivative of these fields. And you see, now actually you create a little scheme because, and that's, you know, for, for those, uh, you know, for the specialists, what we're doing, you're defining our effective theory, right? We are saying that we have the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom are the hydrodynamic fields. And I'm constructing a procedure, right? I'm expanding in a small parameter. This small parameter is precisely uh, the comparison between the scale that, uh, you know, that you have some microscopic physics, for example, the mean free path, which is very, very tiny in a gas, and the scale that, uh, that tells you about the variations of the hydrodynamic fields, right? For example, the temperature, the flow, or the density, they generally vary if you, if you have a fluid, these things vary at scales much larger than the mean free path of the system, okay? So I'm assuming, so there is a small parameter, which is this ratio, and I'm doing, in a sense, a systematic expansion um, in terms of these small parameters. So basically becomes a theory or an effective theory where these things, this guy, and also the same thing for Q, for the energy, dissipative energy current, they can be constructed order by order in this procedure. So there's zero in equilibrium, and then you have something else that has derivatives of this. And then in principle, you could continue, put more and more derivatives, and you keep going farther and farther from equilibrium. If you want to ask me whether this is useful in practice, or if this series converges or not, ask me later, because it's a very interesting question. So the point is, whatever the system is, whatever if you have you know, molecules of air, or dragons colliding. Um, if you have a fluid, the above, these things here, should work if you're sufficiently close to equilibrium. So basically the point is that we're gonna construct the most general ways that these things can behave near equilibrium. And this has to be the answer, at least to a certain approximation, okay? How do you construct this? This is the key. Now I'm getting to the key of this whole thing, including the second seminar. So if you think about this as an effective theory, and we do this in particle physics and, and condensed matter physics as well, the whole point is that it's okay to do this guessing, okay? So if you recall Lendl's theory of phase transition, um, Lendl's theory of phase transitions, invoked precisely this idea, you would be able to construct some free energy density out of just basically knowing what the order parameter is or basically knowing what the order parameter is for Lendl to say what matters to describe the transition. And then um, you had something like this and you had something like this, okay, and so forth. And basically what you did there to describe phase transitions, you just write the most general thing that you can possibly write that is consistent with the symmetries consistent with the symmetries and involves the variables that you considered for your effective theory. So there is the degrees of freedom, DLF. And also you have to have a consistent uh, power counting scheme. So our consistent power counting scheme here is this idea that near equilibrium derivatives are small, so I'm expanding in powers of derivatives of the hydrodynamic fields, okay? So if you play this game, you have to think about it a little bit, consider all the symmetries. Remember the fluid here, uh, there's no other external force. Um, and then for example, if you just look at a single little particle there, you would see the fluid around it as isotropic. So there is some, some rules that you have to find. Um, you have to preserve another, uh, Important problem that you would like to write is that the system is um, invariant under Galileo transformations. So for example, if you just normal relativistically boost the velocity, you should not see some crazy thing coming up. So once we impose all these little symmetries, um, you end up with something that looks precisely like this for a, a, a sigma ij. I'm just gonna write down the answer here and then we're gonna come um, mention 
how these things work. So for sigma, what you see is the following. You need to write down a tensor that is symmetric in the indices and involves only first order derivatives of the fields. And the first order derivatives of the fields have to be such that they vanish in equilibrium, okay? So if you think about it, the only possible thing that you can write are these derivatives of the velocity like this. So this introduces a new coefficient. This is the shear viscosity. This is a transport coefficient. This is a coefficient that is very famous for heavy ion physicists. This is the one that people normally talk about when we talk about the nearly perfect fluidity of the quark plasma. This guy here is called bulk viscosity. And the reason why I'm saying that is unique, so basically what you see here, um, I, I already did some separation. I separated this guy into a traceless tensor, and here's a part of the trace. But basically, the point is that if you really restrict to just use variables of the fluid, like T, V, and rho, and you make sure that all the symmetries are preserved, and you truncate to first order in derivatives, this is it. This is what you can write. Uh, and so then there are, um, yes. Why do you not include time derivatives of the temperature or the mass density? Yes. So the point is that at this level, right, time derivatives, you, you could in principle, okay, so you, you, you got me to a point that I'm going to make later. Um, so here, so it, there are some other symmetries that you could do. So first you have to create something that would still be, um, how to say, um, a tensor. So it would, if you were to create something like this, you would still have to create something that still has this delta ij or is symmetric, right? But your point is to say, like, why don't I create what? What is the term that you would like? So a delta ij uh, derivative respect to time of the temperature and with some coefficient, and the same thing with the mass density. Yes, yes. So why don't you write something like something like some coefficient, some new coefficient? Let's call Will. Uh, <laughs> something like this, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting, right? In principle, you could create this guy um, because this guy here is symmetric. It involves something that is zero in equilibrium, right? Um, so why don't you include it? That's the point. <laughs> that will be my point later. So I'm reviewing what is the standard theory now. So basically the point is that um, defining these new terms, especially the ones with the time derivatives, they will be like defining what really constitutes your fields out of equilibrium, okay? So I'm gonna go back to that. I'm gonna use a simpler example. The shear is more complicated, but in principle, yes. So there are many more terms that people never put in. So you just found one, okay? So let me let, let, let me just go back uh, and say just that, that what the standard spiel is, right? The standard spiel is that if you were to consider this, you wanted to consider just something like that it has just shear and bulk, right? And um, so there's another way. Let, let me, okay, let, let me say the following. Um, you know, um, these people that have been doing fluid dynamics for many years, I mean, they're very far from being, you know, careless. So they thought about these things. But there is a thing that was crucial for them. It was something called the Chapman Anscog expansion. So the Chapman Anscog expansion is something that happens in kinetic theory. So this is when you go from the, the top bottom, right? Because for example, right, you know, people would argue that, oh, this bottom up approach is interesting, but how do you know that you didn't miss something, right? Or what, what, what happens to this or that? So maybe it is better to start from something completely well-defined and then systematically go all the way down to 100 dynamics. So the chapman anscog expansion is the way to do that in kinetic theory, okay? So this was invented 100 years ago. It is a very systematic method. But there, there is a thing in this particular method, which is not, it's amazing. It's sufficient to derive equations that look like hydro, but it's not really necessary. There, 
every single time derivative that would appear in constitutive relations must be changed into spatial derivatives. It's, a, it's a, as an internal property of the method. It's the method is defined like that. But um, my point is that this doesn't need to be. Just because it was done like that doesn't need to be the case. So, and if you do that, so you see, well, terms like the one you said should not show up. Because then uh, basically what I'm gonna show later, DDT would be like the divergence of T or the, sorry, the Laplacian of T and this will be of second order, okay? That's why you don't include in the standard way to do things, okay? Does it make sense? Very good. Okay, cool. So um, then uh, the shear and the bulk viscosities are just quantities that, um, okay, so they are transport coefficients. They can depend on, for example, the temperature and the density. And one thing that you see in order for entropy to be produced, or basically in order for you to preserve the second law of thermodynamics, these quantities have to be positive coefficients. And the shear is the shear viscosity, just parameterizes how entropy is produced if you have some shear deformation. For example, you have some velocity going this direction, but the velocity has a gradient or uh, it changes with, for example, velocity in X changes with a, with, with a Y. Okay, so that tells you how much entropy you produce in this case, while bulk basically tells you how much entropy is produced in your system if, this, if the volume of the system itself changes, okay? So that's what bulk viscosity tells you. Concerning the current, the standard idea is that, oh, okay, now I have to write a vector out of these uh, quantities. There are zero in equilibrium. And, and this, you know, there's a lot of history about it because um, this was, you know, work done by Fourier. The argument is the following. I need to create a vector out of this. So for example, you could ask, why don't you put the derivative of the density? But this is the standard Fourier law, basically saying that uh, this is like fixed law. You now fixed law was the one for the density, right? So basically saying that if you have a system that has a lot of density here and less density there, there's gonna be a current going from the, the dense system to the less dense system. And here is the same idea in the sense that if you have, um, imagine that you have two layers here. So you have like something with some temperature T2 and some temperature T1, but T2 is larger than T1. You would expect, right? That you would see some current, some heat current going from, sorry, the opposite, going from the hot to the cold, right? That's normally how things work. Um, in a system of many body, you know, in, in a many body system, you know, the the system that the, the hot thing tries to heat up the cold thing. So this guy will be this current. That's why there is this little sign, which is a minus sign and kappa. In order for the entropy to be produced, or to preserve the second law of thermodynamics, this guy also cannot be negative. This guy here is called the uh, thermal connectivity. So now we have all the elements that we need to talk about the so-called Fourier uh, Navier-Stokes equations. And the equations, I'm just gonna write them down here. There are dt of rho plus dv rho v equals zero, dt rho vi plus dip plus Vj rho uh, vi vj plus vj sigma j i equals zero. And then the energy current rho v squared divided by two vi. Another thing, Will, that you can think about it, we never put any epsilons like, you know, Levi Civitas, right? We can construct a bunch of tensors out of those. This guy normally is killed. This one is killed by a good reason, uh, for a good reason. It's because of parity. Normally you want to describe things that have some well-defined parity or it doesn't have any parity violation. But once the theory has anomalies, for example, some triangle anomaly, then these sort of objects will have to enter in the constitutive relations. And this is a, a subject for another story. 
So these equations are there, and then the sigma is the one that I mentioned before, and the Q is this Q here, and the sigma normally is this. So this describes, um, this is, you know, people make a living out of this. These equations are very famous. They're, uh, they have been around for more than 100 years. And, you know, they are really precise in the sense that they describe very well what happens to most fluids. To the point that if you're flying in an airplane somewhere, um, it's because people know how to solve these things very precisely. Okay. And um, engineers are fantastic uh, when it comes to this. They have fantastic codes, uh, fantastic understanding of the consequence in the physics of these equations, the Fourier and Everest Stokes equations. So they describe a variety of phenomena in nature, uh, many physical systems going through condensed matter, uh, atomic physics and astrophysics and even nuclear physics, very low energy nuclear physics. People used to solve these equations to describe the collisions of very low energy uh, nuclei or nuclei uh, colliding at very low energy. Um, so basically the idea is that the equations are always the same, but you have, depending on the system, as you vary the type of system that you have, what you do, you vary the equation of state. So you change the equation of state or how P is related to rho and T. And you change also the transport coefficients, these, these things here. So all the microscopic physics of the system, they are, all the microscopic physics contained into the pressure and the viscosities or, you know, shear bulk viscosity and then thermal connectivity. And that's it. So these equations of motion, they are very general, right? So it, it's, it's really beautiful to think about this, right? Because it somehow, uh, it uh, makes it evident that there is some sort of, underlying unity of nature, right? So if you try to describe, so it doesn't matter if you describe little molecules colliding or neutrons in a neutral reactor or uh, just nuclei colliding in low energies, somehow these equations are still there. We just change some little uh, parameters that have to do with precisely these UV properties. And they're so general and they're so important. And I spent a full hour talking about them because they tell you precisely how to map this intrinsic idea that you have about conservation laws or things that just don't disappear like energy, mass and, and momentum here. Um, and they, they sort of put it together, the whole thing about um, conservation laws, symmetries, those are very important. And also a concept of locality, okay? So these equations are so general because they put together these things. So they put together things that exist always, conservation laws. Symmetries, which are fundamental building blocks that we use to constrain our theories. And locality, locality here appears precisely that when I said that the corrections from equilibrium, you will be still in terms of the hydrodynamic variables, I didn't write down some crazy expression involving the derivative of the log of the hyperbolic tangent of something. No, I said, if I'm sufficiently close to equilibrium, I'm gonna write this in terms of derivatives and I'm gonna systematically write this as a power series in derivatives. So it's local in space and local in time, okay? So that is a very important assumption that we made that dictates how this theory looks like, okay? Great, but this is all non-relativistic. And in my experience, it's very important to discuss these issues and sort of explain all these, you know, conservation laws and symmetries of locality in the non-relativistic case. Because in the relativistic case, if you're not a specialist, you can get completely lost with all the mu's and mu's and things like that. But we understood now the bulk of the thing here. Now let's see what happens when we actually go to the relativistic regime. Yes. Is there a question? No, no, okay. Okay. So in the relativistic regime, then we have to be careful because um, there are several things that we had assumed here that will not really be true in relativity. For example, for example, uh, first the velocity and the fact that uh, one of what these equations predict, the Fourier and Everest Stokes equations, they predict basically that if you have some gradient of pressure at one end of the universe, the acceleration changes at the other end of the universe, okay? So these things, so there is no um, notion, for example, of a finite 
propagation speed uh, of information, which is fine uh, in the non-relativistic case because basically any velocity of anything, it's infinitely smaller than the speed of light. So we don't really care about it. So in a sense, it's like saying that the speed of light is infinity. But in a relativistic system, that's not true. And in fact, for us here, I'm going to go to the standard natural units, which is funny because I talk to a lot of condensed matter people here all the time, and they always tell me that this, the natural units are not only natural if you're, <laughs> of course, a particle physicist. And the same thing for gravity, <laughs> people, right? They don't, they don't think that this is natural at all, but I stand by it. I think it's extremely natural. Um, where this the h bar is one, c is one, and kb is one. So what this means is the following, is that I'm going to measure from now on velocities with respect to the speed of light. So for example, the gamma factor that you do in relativity is going to be just this, one minus v squared, because the speed of light is one. So the maximum velocity you can have of anything is one. Uh, and also that I'm going to measure. So for example, if I talk about energy and temperature, they're really they really have the same units, okay? Uh, there's no KKB Boltzmann constant anymore for this. So, uh, and there are several other things that we have to do in terms of units. But the first thing that you see is that, so, so what happens when the speed of, when the velocities uh, involved in the fluid can get close to the speed of light? Then there's all this complication of stuff that you see in, uh, that we learn in relativity, right? So you can have, um, you know, lengths contract and time dilates and things like that. So how does that affect how the fluid actually moves? Um, and another thing, this is very important, the very famous equation that that's the only equation allowed in any public uh, sort yeah. of uh, book, right? This equation for us is very important because before you see, we intrinsically assume if something changed, like, you know, mass change, entropy change is because some particle, something that has mass, went through either coming in or coming out. But what relativity says, the equivalence between mass and energy says that you could actually have energy transport without necessarily having mass transport, right? So the, what, you know, basically the point, and also when you put it together, the fact that you have H bar and C, or you have quant relativistic quantum field theory, once these things switch in, even the very concept of, mass changes in the sense that now you can have particles and antiparticles. And this is beautiful because now, differently than in the non-relativistic regime, in the non-relativistic regime, if I say that there is a fluid, you bet that there is some density, <laughs> right? Because the fluid has stuff and stuff, it's stuff, you know, the density is stuff divided by volume. But in the relativistic regime, you can talk about fluids that have zero net density zero net density because basically what you're seeing is that you have the same number of particles and antiparticles on average. That's actually to a very good approximation what happens at the LHC for nuclear collisions at the LHC. So it's really crazy. You can have transport, you have energy going and stuff like that. But since you can have particles and antiparticles, you can actually have zero net density. So you can talk about hydrodynamics of zero net density. Okay, so um, for some people, this would be crazy, but for us, it's a thing that we do all the time, you have ion collisions. So you should expect many modifications when it comes to those equations there. Um, okay, so the point here is that relativity, the fact that information should not propagate faster than the speed of light, heavily constrains how systems move or how they can dissipate or produce entropy. And as I said before, this was this has been a huge problem in the field since I guess 1940. That's the first time that someone started to write down what would be the theory of relativistic viscous fluids, so what is Eckert, and then Landau Lifshitz did this. And for many years there were several issues, and I'm going to just mention briefly what they are um, in the following. In order to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the diffusion equation and use the diffusion equation to illustrate the issues that can appear if you naively generalize these equations uh, to relativity, okay? So Will, let me know how much time I have because my cutoff is like 7.30 for me, which is like in 20 minutes. Is that is that something that is okay for you? I mean, it's, it's, it's fine otherwise for me. Oh yeah, we're gonna take as much time as you're willing to give. Okay, excellent.
Okay, good. Uh, okay, so let's take a closer look at diffusion. Okay. So, um, you know, you, you can talk about diffusion, just derive the equation and talk about it. But in our case, we can just go back and say that, you know, the density here is constant and the velocity is zero, for example. So it's a static uh, uh, fluid. And in this case, um, a bunch of these terms disappear. The only equation that is relevant is the last one, the energy equation. And if that's the case, you end up with an equation like this, dt epsilon minus di kappa di t is equal to zero. And you can just say that since the density is constant, I can just write this guy here as the specific heat dt of t. And then basically in this case, if rho and V are constant, and I'm also setting V to zero to be easy, I just end up with an equation that is like this, dt equals some d, the diffusion constant, which here is kappa divided by CV, this diffusion constant. This is the diffusion constant that describes the diffusion of temperature. This is the diffusion equation. And basically what this is telling you is that temperature follows this equation if you have disturbances with respect to equilibrium. So this is a first derivative in time. This is a Laplacian. And D is the, the diffusion constant. So here you see that I assumed that kappa doesn't vary significantly in, in space. So I pull it out. Okay, oh, we're gonna just assume that here. So this equation is very useful. So basically um, this describes why, you know, if you're in a room and someone comes in with a weird perfume, <laughs> you can feel it at some point. That's, you know, like these perfume molecules are diffusion. Um, so, but here for temperature, the same thing. Now think about temperature as some field that can vary in time and space. And um, this equation will describe this variation in time and space. So this equation is very famous after the work of Fourier the same guy from the Fourier analysis and things like that. Um, and you know, it will basically describe fluctuations of temperature in this room or the room that you're in. But what are the properties of this diffusion equation? So because of our assumptions that the velocity was constant and rho was constant, blah, blah, a lot of terms disappeared. And we ended up very nicely with a linear PD, okay? It's a linear partial differential equation for the temperature. And linear PDEs are good. Linear PDEs are good. They're easy in a sense to, to work with. And we can use standard techniques that you have seen in classes, uh, either in AM or in quantum mechanics. You can basically do some Fourier transform and solve this thing, right? And you can do several problems. For example, as I said before, you could have some T2 and a T1 here. This guy is larger. You see some current going like that. You can solve the equation under these conditions. And I'm assuming that you know, some of you have done this before in some courses. But basically the point is that in order to solve this linear uh, differential equations, you normally use Fourier transform. You can also use um, um, a Laplace transform, but just let it be here. And this is the notation that I have. So now I have an integral over K the wavelength or the wave number. Um, and this is what I do. So basically, um, just to remind you of the procedure, we get this equation, we get this guy, we plug it here and just compute, right? You see that the spatial derivatives will act precisely on this exponential. So basically you're saying that T is a sum of these uh, spatial like uh, uh, plane waves. Um, this should be a standard procedure for you. Once you plug that back, you see that the differential equation is not a PDE anymore. It becomes an ODE. And the equation is this. This equals minus K squared D T tilde, which you know how to solve. This is just an exponential. What you see is that T tilde as a function of T and K decays exponentially with time like this. So you see, that's what the diffusion does. The diffusion tells you the typical time scale for these things to start to decay. That's what this D does here. And also see that it goes with K squared, okay? So it becomes very small when K is small. 
what which we would call the hydrodynamic limit. But the cool things for you to see is that this guy here decreased exponentially. So what this means is the standard stuff that you um, normally think about when you think about diffusion. So if you have something, imagine that you start with some initial condition that is highly concentrated around some X naught, just think about it in 1D. Then as time goes by, the temperature, so this is the temperature in the beginning, the temperature would diffuse. And by diffusing, I mean that the, the stuff would still be peaked around X naught, but it gets broader and broader and broader and broader, okay? So if you actually solve this, you will see if this guy is like a delta function, uh, the solution will look like a Gaussian, a very nice Gaussian that is expanding in time, You're getting broader and broader with time. So temperature diffuses, that's what it means. There is also something else cool about this equation that I'm certain that you, you have seen before is that, you know, when we write down these equations, I can do just um, not just a, a Fourier in space, but I can also do a Fourier in time. So I do a full, in the sense, 4D Fourier transform. And now I'm gonna be a little bit more careful. Uh, what I mean is the following. I can say the solutions of my equation will have to go like plane waves, exponential minus omega t, so something that can oscillate and decay or not in time, and something that is still oscillates in space. So what I do, I plug this guy into the equation. And, you know, in fact, the full solution, that's what I'm going to write here, is something like this. This is just to set up a notation minus infinity to infinity, and then dk3, q pi cubed, this integrate over our space, ex exponential minus omega t, plus i k x, x, and this is the Fourier transform field, a function of omega and k. Great. So you plug this back into the equation, and um, as long as this guy is a solution, remember the equation is linear, the sum of linear solutions is a solution, right? Um, the only thing that you need to understand is that this, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. We, um, we lost, uh, power, uh, due to South Africa, you know, you know how it works. Second world. Um, yes. so I actually, you, yeah, we've gotten you, you're very loud all of a sudden, which I don't know if I can adjust. Can you hear me now? Is it still very loud? Uh, it's better. Can you be a little bit softer even? Okay. I'll try. Right. I just get excited. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is great stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna. Okay. okay, sorry, we're still. It seems like we're still recording. Okay, so please continue. Okay, okay. So, um, what what I mean is that in order for this to be a solution, um, these you cannot just put any omega. You have it has to be the precise omega that satisfies the equation. So right, George. You, yes. So can we? So we lost you at uh, exponential decay. So I think, um, I think you Fourier transformed back which probably is not too hard to figure out, but we did miss that. Okay, okay. So what I'm saying is that um, if you just expand this guy in plane waves, right? Um, you can write down the most general solution like this, this form. Can you see the, the screen? Yeah, it's great. Okay. So, but what I'm saying is that it's not all omega that works. It has to be the precise omega such that this little guy satisfies the equation. So what you do, you plug it back into the differential equation like this. This was a differential equation before, exponential minus i omega t plus i kx. Um, and you see if you just do the derivatives and cancel the terms that the only omegas that are really allowed to enter here, the omega has to vary with k and it has to work in precisely this way. Okay, good. So this is the hallmark of diffusion. Is that the modes, the energy or the frequency of the modes, they have to vary with, with K, so the wave number. Uh, and basically this tells you that, that's, this is basically describing this, this, this uh, broadening of the solution, right? So why did that, it diffuses? So a mode like this, where uh, the limit when k goes to zero of omega k is going to zero. So the mode becomes arbitrarily slow in time um, when the system becomes arbitrarily close to being homogeneous in space. 
If this happens, this is called a hydro mode. So another example of a hydro mode would be a sound wave, okay? Hydro modes are interesting because they basically tell you what's going on with your system at arbitrarily large times and very, very close to equilibrium. So in the language of particle physics, these hydro modes would be called massless particles. In the language of condensed matter physics, these will be called, these will be called gapless modes, okay? Um, and at very long times and long wavelengths, these modes dominate the dynamics of the many body system. Okay, so how can one modify this physics to try to describe the relativistic regime? So the first thing that we have to try to do is to write something that has at least the hope to be written in a covariant way. By covariant, I mean something that would be intrinsically invariant uh, or change covariantly under Lorentz transformations, right? And this the first equation that I wrote is not, okay? So what you could do, you could start with the equation that you had and just boost it. So now I'm talking about a relativistic boost. So remember the relativistic boost is different than the Galilean boost. The relativistic boost is something that actually messes up time and space. So for example, in one dimension, you go from T to some T prime, that will be something like this. Remember, there's no C here, C is equal to one. So the C squared guy that would go here is one. And X prime is just the omega, a gamma, the gamma factor, the Lorentz the gamma factor, X V T, right? So imagine that you just boost with some constant velocity V somewhere, uh, you actually mess up time and space. So if you plug this into here, you see that now you, you, it, it's not gonna keep the same form, it will change, right? So if you do that, what you end up with, and this is, it's not obvious, but one can derive. So I'm gonna just skip the details. You end up with an equation like this, d mu, u mu d mu t equals d delta mu nu d mu d nu t. Okay, so this is, um, there's some explaining to do here. This d mu is the four vector version of the derivative, which is this. U mu is called a fluid four velocity. And it's something like this, is a four vector, okay? And gamma is just a gamma factor, okay? And this other guy, this delta mu nu is the metric of your space-time, which here is Minkowski. And Minkowski is just like you see in courses, is just a four by four matrix, which is complete diagonal and looks like this, minus, plus, 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 plus because I have good taste, this is what it should look like. Minus plus plus plus, not plus minus minus minus. Um, so this is a, is a joke for those that probably work with plus minus minus minus. Maybe Will does. Um, do you work with plus minus minus minus, Will? Uh, it depends on whether I'm doing particle physics or string theory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, is, it is a tough life. They have to go back and forth. Um, Especially in heavy ice, for some reason, people really like, uh, they really like plus, minus, minus, minus. Um, yeah, so this, yes, sorry? We like positive mass. Sorry? We like it when mass is positive. Yeah, it's, it's. Uh, I don't know. I mean, for me, I, I just use this now. Um, okay, so the important part of this guy, this is an operator or some quantity that is orthogonal to the velocity. So again, I'm using Einstein's notation, the, the summation convention. And this guy here means that, so um, it's orthogonal for the flow. Okay, so this is a little bit complicated, but let me just tell you what the physics is in here. This is an equation that as, as it's written is invariant under Lorentz transformations. And that's what this, this U vector is doing. Because if you change the velocity, if you do a boost, the u changes. But in a way, the equation looks still the same. And this equation, even though it looks more complicated, has some u's and u's, it is basically the same physics as before. Because if you go to the, what we call the local rest frame, so imagine that you're moving together with the flow. This case is when u mu is 1, 0, 0, 0. And you end up precisely with, with, the, with the equation that you had before. So this is just basically a coherent way to write the diffusion equation. Okay, 
So this looks good. Maybe it already did the job. So now I wrote an equation that recovers what I should have before from normal relativistic physics. It at least looks like it's Lorentz invariant or Lorentz covariant. So it should be good. I'm done. Uh, no, we are not done. <laughs> because let's look exactly what are the modes. What are you know? What is the physics that this new equation is telling you? So in order to look at the collective modes, we do the same thing. We just look at Fourier. So we see you know the dispersion relations, how omega varies with k in this theory here. When you try to impose that this is the equation and this should be still invariant on the Lorentz transformations. So if you go and say the t again goes like minus exponential omega t plus i k x, huh? And then you just plug this back into the equation, plug this back into here. Sorry, here. This gets a little bit more complicated. I'm just going to write down what the answer is. Uh, I'm writing down the answer because it's it's relevant for you to see the differences that it makes when you try to impose that equation looks like, um, or that equation preserves, uh, or is invariant under Lorentz transformations. So this omega here, uh, as I said, is just the frequency. Okay. Look at this. Now, this is the equation that defines the dispersion relation from before. Before, I just had this. The answer was very easy. It was, uh, you know, it was a polynomial of order one, okay? Now look at this, because I impose that that equation should have some relativistic property, things changed. What you see now, look at this, this is fantastic. This equation is predicting something different. It's predicting that there should be two omegas because now the polynomial is of second order in omega, okay? So that means that when you try to solve this equation, you should find some omega one as a function of k and some omega two as a function of k. Two modes because the polynomial is of second order. The it turns out that one of the modes is very similar to the mode that we had before. It'll be still a hydro mode in the sense that when k goes to zero, it goes to zero. And it basically describes how hydro or diffusion, or tries to describe how hydro diffusion varies if you vary, uh, if you ha now have something that is close to the speed of light. However, and this is a very important point. This equation, the way we did it, also implies that there is a guy that does not go to zero when the system is homogeneous, okay? There is a guy that goes like this. This is called a known hydro mode. And this known hydro mode must be there. There's no way out. This is just math. And look at how bad it is. Even when the system is homogeneous, it still exists, which, okay. But the problem is it goes like one of the velocity. So it becomes really weird when the velocity of the system goes to zero. And the other part, which is very bad, is that look at this. Remember, the solutions are like this. Oh, minus I omega T. So let me put omega two. Once I put omega two, you see that this guy here is growing with time. So this is unstable. This is an unstable mode. But you know, remember what we're doing. We're basically looking at a, a system with constant density, constant velocity, and I'm just doing very small disturbances in temperature. So I'm looking at disturbances around the equilibrium state. But this is crazy. The, the equilibrium state should be stable. That's the whole point. So what is going on here? This is bad. This is very bad, okay? This equation that I wrote, even though it looked good, it looked kind of relativistic. It has the music news in the right spot, it seemed. Um, this equation predicts that the global equilibrium state is unstable against perturbations. This cannot be correct. There is another issue about this equation, and this takes a long time to explain. I cannot go through here. This equation is what we say, it's not hyperbolic. So basically this equation actually violates causality. Okay, so, this means that disturbances or information carried by this equation uh, propagates information larger than the speed of light. So this is not good for relativity, okay? So deep down what's happening here is that because of this causality violation, you also end up uh, seeing that the thermodynamical equilibrium is not stable, okay? This is not a problem of physics. This is a problem of the theory is what we wrote. The problem was to think that this equation here is correct. 
But of course, nature, like, you know, the universe knows how to do this, right? The universe knows how to do this. Um, you know, just because something is relativistic and it has to create entropy or not, I mean, it doesn't matter. Still has to be caused, relativity still has to be correct. So how do we fix this? There must be a way to do something like this. It's not because the conservation laws are wrong, which is not true. Conservation laws are still there in the relativistic regime. It's not because symmetries are wrong. No, of course, there are symmetries and we have to preserve them and enforce them. And it's not because locality is wrong. And that's the thing that it was the last thing that I remember back in the day when I started thinking about this, like maybe somehow there's some locality assumption that we're making that is not correct. No, this has to be true. So if you think about it from a, a, a effective theory uh, uh, frame of mind, um, we have everything that we need. We have the variables, we have the systematic power counting. It has to work. Why doesn't it work? What, what did we miss? What went wrong? What, what was the problem? So um, let me tell you in a very simple case what the problem is. And I'm gonna go above my cutoff at some point to have to rush and to get my kids into school. But now I have to make this point. I'm sorry to go over time. Um, because this is really the, as, as, uh, as Miklos says, the heart of the matter, right? Um, as, as, as we would remember. Let, let me explain the point. So, to, so then you see what we missed. And this will go back to the comment that Will made almost an hour ago. Um, let's write the original diffusion equation in this form. Let me write it like this. It doesn't seem obvious that it's the same, but it is. Look at this. This guy is equal to zero where now I'm gonna write J zero equals T and J equals minus D gradient of T. If you look like that and you plug it in, you see that it's the original diffusion equation that I had. We can also write this equation in a nice covariant way, D mu J mu, where J mu is J zero J as a four vector, okay? Then basically, um, we can just write the diffusion equation as a conservation law for this current. So the current is covariantly conserved. And there is a, a relation that we have to preserve, which is this thing. These are, as I said before, these are called constitutive relations. Great. Now, um, what I can write down is the following. So the most, so if you think about it, the most general way that I can possibly write this J is like this. So this is a four vector. So I write what it was before, u mu, okay? Um, and now what I did before was to write it like this with a q mu and where q mu was orthogonal to u and um, q mu was minus t, uh, no, sorry, was minus d delta mu nu d nu t. In that way, if I plug this and this into here, I end up with that from the conservation law, I end up with that equation that I found to have a lot of issues. So the problem is not the conservation law. The problem is not that I have to do an expansion derivatives. The problem, as we'll noted, is that we are missing things here. Okay, look at this. This is supposed to be the most general way to do it. So now remember, uh, density is constant, so derivatives are zero. Uh, velocity is constant, so derivatives are zero, but the temperature is not constant, right? Depends on time and space. So the most general thing that I can write that has a correct property, so this Q has to be orthogonal to the velocity. It turns out that indeed, this guy here is the most general thing that I can write for Q, true. However, and that's very delicate, think about this. Why didn't I write something like this? Do mu plus q, but then some new guy that I'm gonna call phi that also go in the direction of u mu. So this is this phi is basically an out of equilibrium correction to the temperature. So it's basically telling you that as the system gets out of equilibrium, this guy switches on. So the temperature in equilibrium and out of equilibrium, they don't need to be the same. And in fact, they never needed to be the same. It was a choice. That's the point. We made the choice before that this term was always zero, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. And in the spirit of effective theory, 
that you have to write down the most general thing possible, consistent with the symmetries that is zero in equilibrium and everything else. What could this phi be? What is the only, the fact that there's only one, what is the only thing that I can write for this phi that is zero in equilibrium and also is linear in derivatives? But think broadly, not just spatial derivatives, but time derivatives as well. The most general thing that I can write is something like this, u mu d mu t. In the local rest frame, this guy would give you dt, okay? The time derivative of t. This guy is zero in equilibrium, but in auto equilibrium, it doesn't need to be zero. But you see, this seems like just, oh, you know, they missed something. But this term makes a humongous difference because now if I plug this guy here, and now we are right, this is the most general thing that I can possibly write up to four sorting derivatives. If I plug this guy into here and compute my d mu j mu equals zero, sorry, it doesn't need to be the quadrant derivative. If I write my d mu j mu equals zero, we end up with an equation that is different. You see, I introduced a new parameter, so a new coefficient that it parameterizes how far from equilibrium the temperature is. And once you do that, you imp impose this equation, you end up with an equation that looks different than before. And the difference is extremely significant. So I'm gonna write it in its full glory. It may look complicated, but we'll discuss its physics very soon. Look at this. If you look just at this part, this is just the equation from before, no difference. That was the one that had all the bad issues. However, now there is a new term. Look at this new term. This new term is very interesting. It introduces two new derivatives that go in the direction of the, the flow velocity. And now, if you think about it, I mean, this now uh, in, the, in the language of PDEs, this is now a hyperbolic PDE, but let's go to the local rest frame where this guy is just like this, where things are the easiest. You will see that this equation becomes dt squared lambda, minus d Laplacian plus dt of t equals zero. This equation is different from before. This guy here was the diffusion part, but now the new term is there to introduce a second time derivative. But if you look about this, look at this. This guy here looks like a wave. It's like a wave equation with the velocity, the group velocity of the wave given by the square root of d over lambda. And that's it. Once you realize that this is the most general thing that it can possibly have, the effective field theory tells you that in principle, there are more terms, you must include them. Once you do include them, you end up seeing that the equation actually was not the one you expected before. It's, it has more terms. And these new terms are actually there to save your life in the end. because if this new parameter is such that this quantity, remember it's a velocity and the speed of light is one. If this parameter is such that this is within zero and one, now the theory is causal. So it respects causality. And now the equilibrium state is actually stable. All of that crazy stuff disappears. It's all good. This respects causality. This is stable. And this equation is hyperbolic. So in principle, it can be consistently solved in relativity, okay? And this is very interesting because the equation has, is like, has two regimes. It has one regime where uh, it looks like a diffusion equation. And there's another regime that it looks like a wave, okay? So somehow the equation is such that very nicely it interpolates between diffusive behavior and hyperbolic wave-like behavior, which is needed for causality. So by taking into account all the possible structures that it can possibly have that appear in the given order of this uh, derivative expansion, one can create a consistent theory of relativistic diffusion. So this requires using a different definition of what constitutes temperature out of equilibrium. And the point is that causality, stability, hyperbolicity, and other things, they actually constrain these constitutive relations, how they can how you can actually map out what happens to temperature, flow velocity, and chemical potential out of equilibrium. 
And um, in the next seminar, what I'm going to do next Friday, I will show you how this idea uh, is generalized, right? So not just for this little example, for something much more complicated, fully nonlinear. Um, and this leads to the first uh, full theory of fluid dynamics that can be solved together with Einstein's equations. Um, so this you can use, for example, neutron star mergers in cosmology. Um, and I think this, this, this idea, this realization, or basically the correct use of effective theory reasoning in high dynamics, I think is very powerful. I believe they will pave the way for a new understanding of fluid dynamics in particle physics in the sense of heavy ions, uh, and also neutron star mergers. So we'll continue then next Friday, uh, but I'm not gonna go over time like I did today, sorry. Thank you. Okay, that was super awesome. Uh, you Are you willing to entertain one or two quick questions? Yes, yes. All right, well, I'm gonna jump in because I know you have to go. Uh, so there's the, the deep problems with Navier Stokes in terms of existence and uniqueness of solutions, you know, Millennium Prize type level of, of complications and, and lack of understanding. Do you think that there's any, um, consequence in terms of thinking about uh, fluid dynamics as an effective field theory when it comes to thinking about non-relativistic Navier-Stokes? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about that a lot uh, because I also want to get that million dollars. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's, it's probably the hardest way to make a million bucks, right? You, you, make, uh, you make more money quickly uh, on YouTube nowadays than this. Um, yeah, so it, 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 the issue is the following. The problem... Uh, so, for example, I, I know this because I have done this. So you can create a, a, a regularized version of Never Stokes that has different terms and it has more, it has better properties. Uh, maybe you can even find one where you can actually prove or disprove the existence of a global solution, right? So a global in time. The problem is that, you know, I work with mathematicians and I've talked to them about this and they say that they don't care because <laughs> their, point is, their point is to understand those equations. With precisely uh, those terms, uh, right? So it's 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 not really the case of whether or not um, we can create better equations that have better properties. I think it's more like it became a thing to understand those equations themselves. So I don't think it's going to lead to precisely uh, insight into the math, uh, like for the Clay Prize, but I think it certainly leads to insights in terms of physics, right? Because we can write effective theories. We can embed these effective theories into an action, right? And talk about thermal and, 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 and quantum fluctuations. So I think physics-wise, of course, there's a lot of stuff that um, uh, we can still learn and provide. But I think mathematicians, they have a, a, a different life. So one thing that I did before, I was like, oh, I can bootstrap my way towards the prize, right? So I start, no, I start relativistic, and then I do a systematic expansion in powers of V. And then what, you know, and then I, you know, uh, I do everything relativistic, which is easier. And then I go back to normal relativistic. Um, then I remember talking to my friend and he was like, yeah, great. But you have to prove that every single property that he derived before works at every single order in perturbation theory. And no, you're not going to prove that. So I don't know. I, I, I would be surprised. Um, but, but for example, one of the things that we are doing now, Will, is actually understanding these global properties for these equations. So the equation I'm going to show later, the ones with, with G, GR and everything else, so there's a lot of people trying to understand, you know, if the solution, so we, we can prove that the solutions exist locally, they're unique and things like that, but we don't know what happens at some finite time. So we know that it starts good and keeps evolving, but what happens, you know, at finite time? Will this produce some shock wave? And in the context of relativity, is this going to produce a black hole or something else? We don't know. Um, so I, I think there will be a lot of activity uh, in, in that sense, but I don't know how much the mathematicians uh, are going to, enjoy this maybe in a hundred years i don't know they're different people okay I, I, I hear your point in terms of the clay prize but there's something deeply disturbing about equations that we think govern the natural world that don't have the existence and unique properties that we would require of a physical theory so i think having an understanding of of the improvement of navier stokes to a set of equations that are more physical would be really really interesting I think for us, yes. I'm not sure. I, I still don't understand what mathematicians think is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> they're, as you say, they're a different breed. Okay. They're different. Uh, uh, any last questions for our speaker who's generously given his children's time to us? <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, no, I think that's it. So thank you so much. That was really, really great. Thank you. I, I'm really excited, and I'll, I'll talk to you then uh, same time, right, on next Friday. But then, then I will use uh, you know slides and everything. Perfect. So uh, just tell us to uh, smash and like that subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, that's the future, man. I mean, you know, at some point we're gonna go to Quark Matter, and then we're gonna walk around with a shirt say like, "This talk is brought to you by Carl's Jr." or something like that. <laughs> uh <laughs> I'm, yeah. going for, I'm going for in and out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, very good. I'll see you later. Really, really appreciate it. Take it. Bye.